Let's turn now to one of the most closely watched races this fall, and it comes out of the state of Maryland, where a political newcomer is now the Democrat nominee in the race for governor. Wes Moore, a veteran of the war in Afghanistan, beat out a crowded Democratic primary field, one that included some of the best-known figures in the state, like former DNC chair Tom Perez and Maryland's longtime comptroller Peter Francho. Moore will face Trump-endorsed hard-right candidate conspiracy theorist Dan Cox in November, and that's the way Democrats say they wanted it. Democrat a governor's association boosted Cox's profile in the final weeks of that race with an ad that described him as, quote, too close to Trump. Take a look. 100% pro-life. He's fighting to end abortion in Maryland. And Cox will protect the Second Amendment at all costs, refusing to support any federal restrictions on guns. The tactic of helping far-right candidates win primaries has been criticized as dangerous by some Democrats and Republicans, including Maryland Governor Larry Hogan. He says he will not back Cox, despite his being the party nominee. The DGA, I think, spent about $3 million. The guy only spent $100,000 in his campaign. So uh, it was a win for the Democrats. It's a big loss for the Republican Party, and we have no chance of uh, saving that governor's seat. We actually had a chance uh, if they hadn't gotten together and done that. And you definitely won't support him. You'll, no, you'll... I would not support the guy. I wouldn't let him in the governor's office, let alone vote for him for the governor's office. Governor Hogan also, by the way, did not reject the idea of supporting our next guest. He is the Democratic nominee for governor of Maryland, Wes Moore. Wes, it's great to see you. Congratulations on the nomination. Um, as I mentioned, a crowded field. You've been at this for a long time. Some better known names nationally and in the state who had an awful lot of support in this race. How did you come out of that 10 person field? Well, I think we built an unparalleled coalition uh, and an unparalleled coalition that were focusing on the things that people were telling us were the most important issues in their own lives, which was the economy and which was public safety. You know, we ran our campaign with a core focus on creating pathways for work and wages and wealth for all Maryland families. We created a platform to make sure that people could feel safe in their own communities and in their own homes and in their own skin. And we really built a race that focused on something that I learned when I was in the military when I was 17 years old, uh, which was leave no one behind. And that is the vision that we laid out. And I think it was one that, uh, that resonated with Maryland voters. So, Wes, there's been this almost quiet celebration among Democrats that Dan Cox, with their help, became the Republican nominee. They think he's too extreme and he's too crazy and he can't win. I know you a little bit, so I know that you probably don't agree that he can't win and that you're taking this very seriously. But what do you make of the way that Democrats propped him up? Well, well, first, first, you're right, Willie. I mean, we, we cannot take this lightly. Uh, this is a celebratory moment, and we're excited about the campaign that we've run. But this is also very sobering. We're, we're literally talking about we're running against someone who is an insurrectionist, someone who paid for buses to go down on January 6th, someone who still believes to this day that Donald Trump is the president of the United States, someone who tried to impeach Larry Hogan. Uh, and so we are taking this very seriously, and I think people make a mistake by underestimating him. I think the other thing, though, is the idea that uh, that that he he won because of, of an ad that was pulled together. Uh, I, I think is also a bit short-sighted, because first of all, the ad that the DGA ran, which was describing Dan Cox, was accurate and it was true. There was nothing in there that was incorrect, nor nothing in there that Dan Cox wouldn't defend. The second thing, though, is candidates have to win their own races on their own merits. And, and I think part of the reason why uh, the people think that we're surprised, or people even were surprised at our race, is they weren't spending time in communities. If you spend time in communities, if you spend time in our neighborhoods, if you spend time in all 24 jurisdictions in the state of Maryland, I think people would look and see that what we saw with our race was not a surprise, uh, the fact that we surged and, uh, and, and were able to win. But I think people would say the same thing about Dan Cox. So we cannot take this threat lightly. It is serious, and our campaign is going to move as such. Where's good talk to you? It's Caddy Kay here. Um, you know, people I think think of Maryland and they think of, and they think of the Maryland Republican Party as Larry Hogan esque. But this was effectively a race between a kind of battle between Hogan's version of the Republican Party and Donald Trump's, and Donald Trump won. Which makes me wonder whether Maryland is not what people think it is. Is Maryland actually more of a conservative Dan Cox type state? Has it become that than than we are aware of? And would that state? Vote for Wes Moore. 
You know, I, I, I think this is a state that, that cares about a lot of the kitchen table issues uh, that a lot of people around the country are thinking about. I think what we continue to hear from people is that people are concerned about the, the price of things, right? You know, people want to know that you have a governor that's going to focus on getting people back to work. And that's why we made a central component of our campaign, things like fixing a broken child care system because it's one of the core ways we can both get people back to work, and particularly women, uh, who oftentimes have been trapped and left out of a workforce because we have a broken childcare system. It's people who are concerned about the fact that we don't have public, uh, proper public transportation, where you know I, I led one of the largest poverty fighting organizations in this country, and we invested tens of millions of dollars in job training programs. But the reality is, if a person can't get to the job, then what's the point? And I think people were concerned about having a world-class education system, an education system that's, that's helping our children to become not just employees, but employers, focusing on mental health for educators and also for students. And so I think what we are seeing in the state of Maryland is, is people are, are, are focused on making sure that they have a governor that can focus on them and not just simply believe, you know, just swallow wholeheartedly uh, an, an ideology of, of Donald Trump or anyone else. And that's why we believe that we're gonna be successful in, in the general election as well. We've got the perfect person to talk about this race here, Wes Michael Steele, who of course was the former Lieutenant Governor of the state of Maryland. Um, Michael, I'll let you take a question to Wes, but let's talk about him like he's not here for a minute. Uh, what sure. do you make of him uh, in this race and his opponent, the Republican nominee, Dan Cox? Uh, well, it, I think it's going to be a fascinating race. I've known Wes for a long time. Uh, he's a good brother. I think he's going to be, um, you know, a, a bring an interesting dynamic to the table. But I think Caddy put her finger on a very interesting point here, that Maryland is not as liberal as a lot of people believe it to be. We have very strong conservative sections of the state, from Baltimore County to the western parts, the, the shore. Um, and so it's going to be a matter of how Wes begins to uh, talk to those voters. Um, Baltimore County is a big play. Montgomery County, yes, liberal bastion, but there's some conservative threads, particularly on the fiscal front. So the question for, for Wes would be, you've got a fairly aggressive agenda. You, you have a big plans, but uh, the federal payments are not going to be there from COVID. So you're, you're losing uh, substantial income there. Um, you've got a very progressive legislature that wants to spend a high heaven. Uh, one of the big battles that Larry Hogan and the comptroller, Peter Franchot, had to battle up against. How do you juxtapose your agenda against an overzealous uh, legislature that thinks, oh, now we've got a Democrat, we've been out of power for eight years, here's the laundry list of things that we want to do from raising taxes to uh, spending for, for programs um, as the, the state's economy begins to contract because of inflation? because of rising prices. Yes, wages are going up, but not at the same rate. Uh, we've got the federal uh, system up as a part of our economy, but it's the federal system, it's not state. So how, how are you looking at going into uh, that conversation with voters this fall, and then on the other side as governor, uh, laying down some, some, some lines for a, a democratic legislature that may be excited to see you, thinking that you're just gonna give them the pen to write whatever check they want. Yeah. No, th th thanks, Mike. It was great seeing you. And, and, and you know, and I, and I tell you, I, I, I think about the way we campaign in the primary, and there's going to be no difference in the way we campaign in the general. And there are people who are saying, even during the primary, and, and you know, uh, where we were campaigning all over the state, even a lot of places, that there weren't a lot of Democrats. And people were like, you know, you guys were campaigning in a lot of places, even where there's not a lot of Democrats. Uh, and my point, what's back to them was, yeah, but there were a lot of Marylanders there. And I plan on being their governor, too. And we're proud of the fact that we were able to win not just Baltimore City and, and, and Baltimore County, but also we are able to win over in the Eastern Shore. Right? We were able to win a lot of different places and diverse places that oftentimes Democrats did not perform. And when we were having conversations with people, I remember having conversations with a group of small business owners in, in, in Dundalk. And, and as you know, Michael, uh, there's not a whole lot of Democrats in Dundalk. And, uh, and, you know, I was giving them my plan for small businesses about how we want to have economic growth, how we want to recruit and retain. And one of them stopped me and they said, listen, I love what you're saying, but I'm on the other side. And I said, what does that mean? And he said, it, it just means I'm a Republican. And I said to him, I said, do you know a question I never once asked my soldiers when I was leading paratroopers in Afghanistan? What's your political party? Never asked that question. 
You know what I never asked questions when I ran a successful small business in Maryland? You know, how did you vote in the last election? It wasn't something that got brought up. And so you're absolutely right. People are, 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 are focused on their economic stability in this situation. And I think that we have come up with not just, uh, you know, not just the most uh, uh, you know, practical, uh, but really aggressive policies on how to create work and wages and wealth, creating a, a service year option for every single high school graduate, making sure that we're having job training and job placement, and also investing heavily in apprenticeship programs and trade programs, getting people back to work with fair wages. And I think that's the thing that's resonating and, and honestly, it's the thing that I think that people are going to care about most inside of a general election as well.